Hello and welcome to Technology Connectors Sights and Sounds. Today we are going to be looking at and listening to The Statesman by Wurlitzer, perhaps the ugliest jukebox ever made. Before we get started, because it's been a long time since I've made one of these, I want to explain the purpose of this series. Sights and Sounds is a way for me to repackage old B-roll from previous projects to accomplish two purposes. First, I can show off a lot of B-roll that just wasn't seen in the main video because generally there's much more than makes it into the final video. But secondly, I can make an audio descriptive video for people who cannot see what's on the screen. Now, because of that, I'm going to be describing a lot of what we see verbally, and for this particular subject, there's a lot of description we need. So for those that are looking for an audio experience, this is like 95% me talking, just because there's a heck of a lot we need to explain as far as how the jukebox works. So this is a long video. It's gonna take a while for us to get through all this, but I hope everyone can find it enjoyable and useful. So I'm gonna start this video by just getting right into it. And I've set up a sequence which will replicate basically everything a user would do to use this jukebox in the real world. Now, a couple of caveats. Uh, most of these shots have the lid open, and also the back of the machine is missing a panel, so these noises are louder than they would be. Uh, normally they'd be pretty muffled and the music would be the loudest part. Uh, but you will hear me insert a coin into the coin mechanism, the latch mechanism will engage, and then I'll make a selection, you'll hear the disc play, and then it will put the disc back and stop playing. So, let's do that. And we'll do that one more time. So now that we've experienced the meat and potatoes, I'll go ahead and give a description of the jukebox. So jukeboxes, at least real jukeboxes that took real money to play real music in real places in the real world, are not small objects, and this fella is no exception. So the overall dimensions of the jukebox, as you're standing in front of it, and imagine it's in front of a wall, the thing is 41 inches wide, which is 104 centimeters. It sticks out from the wall 24 inches, or 61 centimeters, and its highest point off the floor is 53 inches up, or 134.62 centimeters. So the highest dimension is the height. However, 
The top third of the jukebox is basically just the thin section of the control panel. If you can imagine about two thirds up its height, there is about at waist height, a big horizontal surface. You can absolutely imagine bar patrons putting their drinks on there while they made selections for the jukebox. And that surface is a piece of glass which has all the selection slips below it which tell you all the songs that are actually in the jukebox. And then at the back of the machine there is a vertical piece, that's the control panel. On the right we have the coin slot and a bunch of indicator lights. On uh, To the left of that there is a pretty blank panel that actually contains the treble speakers. Then above that we have the buttons. We we have the letters A through V, that's 20 letters, I and O are skipped because they look too similar to 1 and 0. Then there is a reset button, and then there are the numbers 1 through 0. And finally above that we have a weird mountain scene for some reason. This would have an animation running, but the components that make the animation work are not in the machine right now. And that animation by the way is just like the it's really weird. I it's basically like supposed to make it look like the clouds are moving or something. It doesn't it's not convincing at all. Now, the reason why I say this is the ugliest jukebox ever made is because this jukebox was the first model to use the Wurlamatic record changing mechanism and that mechanism marked an official giving up on making the jukebox interesting to watch. Uh, they had actually kind of already given it up a little bit beforehand, but to explain, from the 1930s until the end of the 1960s, all the jukebox manufacturers put their mechanism on display. So you could actually watch the thing, grab the records, put them on the turntable, however that might happen. Towards the end of the 60s, I guess people just stopped caring about that, and Wurlitzer's previous model, the Americana 2, let me double check that, no, excuse me, the Americana 3, the 3300 model, it actually had the old mechanism in it, uh, and that mechanism was meant to be seen, but they just hit it. So it was buried low in the jukebox, and it was a similar design to this one. For the Statesman, having officially decided to throw in the towel, they put together a new record-changing mechanism, which was uh, not, not a looker, let's just put it that way, but it is very much what you might consider a typical a uh, record player. But before we look at that, the other thing about it being ugly is not just that you don't get to see what's going on on the inside, but the aesthetic of this jukebox in particular is less of something colorful, something nice to see in the corner of a bar, and more like a weird piece of lounge furniture. It's very brown, which of course, you know, I like brown, but even I will say this is way too much brown. Um, the sides of it are a simulated wood grain. The front panel where the bass speakers are down below is this weird three rectangles that have kind of an orange and gold pattern in the back and it's got a bunch of holes in it to let the sound through. Um, and then right below the main shelf part there's a black strip that goes around the sides and that's our only interesting colored area. We have a purple illuminated strip that says Statesman by Wurlitzer. Unfortunately it's broken on my machine but oh well. It's just cracked. But the uh, that strip there is actually kind of interesting because the way that it's screen printed when it's not illuminated it's white. So on the back of this glass there's a printing there's a layer of white ink then there's purple behind the white so when it's illuminated it looks purple. And then also on the words statesman the purple is actually removed and the word statesman appears in orange but then there's actually another layer of black lettering on the front side of the glass. So you do have a slight 3D effect going on. It's it's pretty interesting, I'll give it that. But then the rest of it, there's a lot of chrome at the top. The top piece is like a fake leather texture, even though it's just plastic. It's just, it's not a very pretty jukebox, but that's why it was cheap. So now I'll go ahead and open it up. So the top section that has the shelf at the bottom with all the selection in it, and then the uh, uh, control panel at the back, that big L-shaped piece 
lifts up on this massive hinge and there's a bunch of uh, there's these counterweighted spring things to help keep it up it's a pretty elaborate um setup here oh and i forgot to mention the weight of the jukebox this this big fella weighs 372 pounds or 168 kilograms it is not fun to move around let me tell you Okay, so now we are looking down into the jukebox at the Wurlamatic mechanism. So again, this was the first machine to use this. In this machine, it's mostly blue, but I've seen other examples where it's kind of a cream or off-white color. And anyway, this is a pretty stripped down automatic record player mechanism. So on the left-hand side of the machine, we have a big carousel of records that looks kind of like a big donut. It's a big toroidal shape. It's not quite full of records, but it can hold 107 inch 45 RPM records. And they make a big circle in a carousel. On the right hand side of that carousel, there is a white hoop. And that hoop, it's, it's a little more than half of a circle. And it is surrounding one of the records. Right now, this thing is surrounding the top and sides of one of the records. And there's a little finger thing down at the bottom that moves to actually grab onto one of those records. That hoop thing is the record transfer arm, which will grab the record, pull it out of the carousel, and then slap it down onto the turntable, which is to the right. It's a pretty standard looking turntable. It just happens to be a little bit small because it only plays seven inch records. It also has an, uh, a large center spindle. And this machine has the ability to play 33 and a third RPM records that have a small hole. So if there's a seven inch record with a small hole, it will actually uh, drop down that middle part and slow the record down to 33 and a third RPM or slow the turntable down to 33 and a third RPM. Pretty cool feature. Um, I have, I don't have any records that use it. So what's good though about that is I have a couple of um, 45 RPM records with a small hole. And rather than having to cut out the middle section, I was able to just unplug the solenoid, which runs that speed changing mechanism. So that way it, it doesn't work. Um, and so those records work fine in the machine. But if I had some of those interesting like small LPs or whatever they called them, I would need to find a workaround. But in any case, doesn't matter. I'm off on a tangent. We are now looking from the back of the machine and because we're looking forward, everything is flipped. So now the carousel of records is on the right and the record turntable is on the left. What I want to point out here is that directly below the carousel of records is a weird looking contraption hanging underneath it. That is the selection accumulator, and it is incredibly important for how the machine works. Basically, that part has more control over anything else in the machine, and I will get to explaining that just in a moment. But I want to establish the concept that where this part lives in the machine is directly below the carousel of records, because that's going to be very important as we go on. So now let's dissect everything that happened in the intro sequence. So first, I want to talk about the coin mech a little bit more in detail. The jukebox has a fairly complicated coin mechanism because it not only has to accept or reject coins, but it also has to sort them and change the value depending on what it accepts. This coin mech accepts nickels, dimes, quarters, and half dollars. I am not sure if it accepts dollar coins. I don't know when the Susan B. Anthony dollar came out. I am sitting in front of a computer. How about I answer that? Uh, coin, when did that first appear? 79, it looks like. So no, I don't think it takes any dollar coins. Um, if I have any numismatists in the audience, you can correct me. But so I think it's just nickels, uh, nickels, dimes, quarters, and half dollars. And those different coins, when they fall in, will land on a different switch. So uh, in this shot, I have two different shots here. One is just closer on a smartphone. We are watching the coins fall into the coin mech and landing on one of the various switches. In my particular jukebox, the credit unit is completely borked. I don't know what is wrong with it. Uh, in this shot, you might notice that it's missing a relay. I've put that relay there. I ended up using it for the main record changer function, but I can't get the credit unit to work at all. Don't know what's wrong with it. 
So I just gave up because it's set to free play, it doesn't matter. But if the credit unit were working, its job would be to count up from zero and add the appropriate number of credits depending on what coins you had inserted. And so long as it registered a credit, it would send power to the latch solenoid. The latch solenoid's primary function is to enable the keyboard. Without the latch solenoid active, the buttons don't do anything. If there's a theme to this jukebox, and indeed this video, it would be electrical simplicity made possible by mechanical complexity. One single device, a solenoid, which is simply a cylindrical electromagnet that draws a steel plunger inside itself to pull on something, is doing a heck of a lot for this jukebox. Now, this is going to be difficult to describe verbally, so much so that I've resorted to scripting this section, but I'll try my best. The latch solenoid is part of a sort of panel contraption that sits behind the keyboard. Ordinarily, this panel faces down towards the inside of the jukebox, but with the lid open and the buttons pointed at the ceiling, the panel faces outward. The solenoid is sitting on the right side of this panel, arranged vertically, with the plunger sticking out the bottom. When it's energized, it pulls the plunger upward, which pulls on a large L-shaped bracket that surrounds the solenoid on the right side and sticks up above the solenoid. And then that bracket is attached to a long linkage which travels far to the solenoid's left. Ultimately, these two brackets here simply redirect the motion of the solenoid's travel from up and down to left and right, and relocate where it applies its pulling force. I honestly can't fathom why it was designed like this, as there looks to be room for the solenoid to simply pull directly on the linkage, but it is what it is. To the left of the solenoid is where the action actually occurs. Three vertical linkages are arranged one after the other, and are connected at the bottom to a horizontal piece. Overall, this has a sort of trident shape. The middle prong of this trident is substantially taller than the other two. And this is what the solenoid is pulling on. It pivots at its bottom, and the solenoid pulls its top to the right slightly when energized. On either side of it are linkages that attach to the keyboard. Now, if you're wondering how there are only two linkages for 20 letter buttons and 10 number buttons, well, behind the keyboard, spanning the length of all the letter buttons, is a large metal bar with angled slots cut into it at every button position. When any of the 20 letter buttons is pressed, it will engage with its angled slot and push that bar to the side. There's a similar bar behind all the number buttons, and these two sliding bars then attach to the linkages on the latch solenoid contraption. The left-hand linkage connects to the letter buttons, and the right-hand linkage connects to the number buttons. These two linkages pivot at their top, and when buttons are pressed, their bottom section moves outward slightly. These linkages are so complex because they need to do two things. First, they need to actually hold on to the keyboard buttons that are pressed so they'll stay depressed when let go. So they have that mechanical aspect first. If the solenoid is pulled in, then the buttons will latch in place. That's why it's called the latch solenoid. We'll get into why exactly that needs to happen shortly, but this is why we have that reset button. If you've pressed the wrong button, you'd like to be able to correct that. The reset button is simply a momentary switch that will interrupt power to the solenoid. That will cause it to let go, and a spring will pull the linkage in the other direction to release the erroneously pressed button. Here's what that sounds like. Letter, reset, number, reset, letter, reset, number, Reset. The second thing these linkages need to do is connect some circuits together. The linkages have small protrusions on them which push against various banks of switches as they move. Some of the switches are stacked with multiple contact points within them, and others are simpler. And these need to be there so that the buttons on the jukebox actually do things. Or possibly not do things. For instance, I could just hold down a letter and number button manually, but we don't want that to do anything unless there's a credit on the jukebox. Otherwise, that'd be the world's easiest cheat code. So the center linkage, in addition to allowing the buttons to latch mechanically, also pushes on a switch stack, which enables the selection process to occur. 
The linkages that are attached to the letter and number buttons also press on switch stacks, and they are wired such that both stacks need to be activated simultaneously for the selection sequence to start. Essentially, there's a switch in the number stack wired in series with another switch in the letter stack, and those could very well also be wired in with the latch solenoid switch stack. On an abstract level, you can think of this as three buttons that all need to be pressed at the same time for something to happen, one of which is in the control of the latch solenoid, and so ultimately the credit unit. There are two more switches inside this contraption, but I couldn't tell you exactly what they do. Oh, and outside of the contraption, there are also two slider switches called LP conversion switches. One applies to selections A1 through A0, and the other applies to B1 through B0. These switches will make those selections cost more to play, as one of the features of this jukebox is the ability to play 7-inch LPs, which run at 33 and a third RPM. But that's not important right now. So, all this stuff we've been talking about is in service of making selections. The jukebox has 100 records in it, and it can play both sides of each one, so we need a way for it to locate and play one of 200 specific selections. Obviously, the selection buttons have something to do with that, but to understand why they need to be held in by the latch solenoid, and also explain why all those switches and linkages are there, we need to talk about the selection accumulator. Now remember, this thing hangs underneath the carousel of records. That's where it lives. And its fundamental purpose is to flag specific locations for the rotating carousel to stop and play a record. And how it does that is pretty wild. All right, so here we are looking at the selection accumulator removed from the jukebox. This object is a round device about the size of a medium round cake, so it's about 10 inches across, or 25 centimeters, and 4 or 5 inches thick, something like 10 to 12 centimeters. Looking at the underside of the selection accumulator, we find a motor attached to a gear train which ultimately turns a gear in the very center of the selection accumulator. Then on the bottom we can see a brown printed circuit board that has a ton of wires soldered to it in various places. All those wires then come together into a wiring loom, which ultimately ends in a large connector. Looking now at the top of the selection accumulator, we can see that the bulk of this device is actually empty. We are looking at the top of that printed circuit board that all the wires connected to, and one thing that I want to make clear is that there is no componentry on this board. In fact, calling it a circuit board is a little bit of a misnomer. This is made of the same material as a circuit board, and it has a bunch of wires soldered to it like a circuit board, but those wires are simply connected to contact patches in various shapes. So the bulk of this board is brown and insulated, but we have a ton of differently shaped patches which are then soldered to the wires underneath. Now sitting on top of this printed circuit board is an armature that spans the diameter of this circular device. It's attached in the center to the gear we saw below, so this armature will actually spin around as the motor turns. On either end of this armature, we find an electromagnet. Now these are very important for the function of making selections, and I'll explain that as we go on. So to recap, picture a round printed circuit board with a bunch of differently shaped contact patches that are soldered to the wires coming out the bottom of the selection accumulator, and on top of that circuit board we have an armature which will spin around, and that has an electromagnet on each end. So now, surrounding the perimeter of this circuit board, and making up the majority of the object's height, we have a series of 200 pins. Now, these pins are flat metal blades, roughly 8 centimeters long and just about a millimeter thick, and every other pin has a section cut out of its top. What we'll find is if you look at one pin, the left-hand section is missing, and then the next pin, the right-hand section is missing, and that alternates with every other pin. These pins physically represent the selections in the jukebox, and the reason for the alternating notches is because the record changer can play either the A side or the B side, and that's how it distinguishes between the two. We'll explain all that in just a moment, but the critical thing about these pins is a spring on every single one wants to pull it upward but they are resting on the smallest of catches so that they won't, they're, they're stuck down. 
However, if they get moved inward ever so slightly, that catch will be released and they will pop up. In this shot, I'm just barely touching them with my finger and you can hear them click as they stick up from the rest of the pins. Now they don't even move a centimeter, they move a very small amount, but that's all we need for the record changer to be able to locate a record. So now you may have already figured that the electromagnets are what pull those pins inward so that they will pop up, and that would be correct. So now we need to talk about how that electromagnet is going to get behind the correct pin and how it's going to fire in just that position. So, remember all those contact patches? Well, here's where they come in. We have broadly three different zones of contact patches here. Uh, there's the outermost zone, which has to do with the selections, and then we have two inner zones that do other things, and I'm going to start with them. On the bottom of the armature, there are feelers that are physically reaching down and touching the surface of the circuit board. And we actually have a grand total of, I gotta think through this, 10 feelers. They are arranged in five pairs, and first I'm going to talk about a single pair at the far inside part of the armature. So remember, these feelers are reaching down and touching the surface of the circuit board, and they are electrically conductive and interface with the contact patches. So, at the very center, we're going to find two rings, one of which is continuous, and the other has a gap at 12 and 6 o'clock. These rings are connected to a pair of wires coming out of the selection accumulator, and if they should become electrically common, or they become bridged, what that's going to do is it's going to energize a relay. The two feelers hanging down the bottom of the armature are actually just shorted together. So if the feelers are touching both sides of this ring, that relay will become energized. And what that relay does is actually turn on the motor of the armature. This device, like many things in electromechanics, is partially self-powered to ensure that it makes a complete cycle whenever it gets started. And in this shot, the selection accumulator is hooked back up to the jukebox, but it's not where it's supposed to be, it's just sitting on the floor. Every single time I push the armature by hand, just a little bit, it springs to life and makes a 180 degree rotation before stopping again. This is happening because of those feelers and those rings. At the 12 and 6 o'clock position, one of the feelers is in the gap on that broken ring. But if it's out of either of those positions, well suddenly that feeler has moved on to the ring. So now the feelers are bridging the two rings together, which sends power to that relay, which in turn sends power to the selection accumulator motor, so it starts turning. And because those rings are continuous until the 12 o'clock position, well, it's just going to keep on going until it gets there, and the one contact slips off the ring, so the relay opens up and the power is cut. Now, a complete cycle is only 180 degrees in this case because we have the electromagnet on each end of the armature. There's no reason for it to make a complete circle. And that also allows us to use another pair of feelers, in fact, two pairs of feelers to do two different things with each rotation. So now, just outside of the rings we were talking about, well, we have another pair of rings. These are larger because it's a bigger diameter. However, these are actually different between each half of the selection accumulator. You'll find that on one side we actually have a solid ring and then a whole bunch of little dashes, so the outside ring is broken up in multiple locations. And then on the opposite side, we actually don't have a lot. It's mostly blank, but there's just a couple of sections that have two contact patches next to each other. We can see a wear pattern on the surface of the circuit board because the feelers have been spinning around on this thing for decades, but the actual contact patches on the right-hand side, they're very scant. These contact patches can do a whole bunch of things in sequence. So let's talk about the bigger one that has all of those dashes on it.
if you can imagine the inside ring is providing a source of voltage, and the outside ring with all those tabs is a different place for the voltage to go. So we have those two feelers, just like before, riding along these contact patches as the armature spins, and the one is a constant supply voltage bridged to another, which will touch a number of contacts in sequence. So what this is really doing is this is sending voltage to one location, then the next, 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 all automatically without us having to do any sort of wonky circuitry. Because remember, that's what electromechanics is. It's electrical simplicity made possible by mechanical complexity. If we want a number of different things to be activated in sequence, all we need to do is build this device, which will power itself once it moves out of a home position and makes a sweep across a number of contacts so that they get power one after the other. You can think of this like a row of buttons that are being pressed, doot, 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 doot. But instead of buttons that each have their own switch contacts inside, it's just one continuous ring being bridged across several dashes of contact patch material. Now, several of the patches in my particular jukebox don't actually do anything because they powered optional features. So for example, those LP conversion switches that I talked about, well, this would be one way that you could remove multiple credits. So if you had a selection which cost, say, three credits, well, you would have the armature sweep across and fire the countdown solenoid in the credit unit, whatever it's actually called, and go click, 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 and take off three credits. But there were also even more expensive selections. They were called like the red button and the gold button, and they might take off five credits. So that's what's going on with all these patches. The armature could spin and go bop, 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 fire the uh, deduction solenoid five times, and there go your five credits. But one of the features that is absolutely enabled here is a brief release of the latch solenoid. If we go back to the clip of me just pushing this by hand, the camera is not positioned well for you to be able to hear it, but listen closely and you might hear the ka-chunk of the latch solenoid briefly letting go and then pulling back in. That's happening because right before the selection accumulator gets back to its home position, one of those contact patches is sending power to a relay, which will flick off the power to the latch solenoid. I'm not sure because I don't have the schematics with me, but I believe the latch solenoid is wired through the normally closed contacts of a relay, and so if that relay gets pulsed briefly, it will actually lose power on the solenoid. So now we've established that the inner contact rings of the selection accumulator will ensure it always makes a complete cycle, and the outer contact rings can do various things simply because of the fact that the physical location of the feelers riding below the armature changes as the armature spins around. So now we get to talk about the meat and potatoes, which are the hundreds of contact patches on the outside perimeter. It's actually 220, so hundreds might be a stretch, but anyway. So the electromagnets on each end of the armature. Of course, they also have feelers reaching down and touching the surface of this circuit board. These feelers are differently shaped because they have to be very narrow on account of the fact that the outermost contact patches are very, very skinny. These contact patches are literally one two hundredth of the circle. They're actually slightly less. They are one two hundred eighth, if I've counted the gaps in the pins correctly. And these patches represent the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and zero. And then they repeat. These patches are wired in to the actual buttons on the keyboard. You may have already guessed that, but that's why we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 0. Every single button on the keyboard has a wire coming down into the selection accumulator and touching these patches. In the case of the number patches, they repeat every 10 patches, and you can actually see on the bottom the wiring loom has a ton of ivory wires just looping repeatedly because they only need to start at one of the contact patches and then just loop to the 11th, the 21st, the 31st, the 41st, all the way until the 
191st, right? I think that's right. And then just inside from the very edge of the circuit board, we have these wider contact patches that span 10 number patches. Can you guess what these connect to? That's right, the letter buttons. So when you press a letter and a number button, what you're doing is you're creating a complete circuit across one letter patch and all of the number patches. When the armature spins around, the electromagnets are reaching down with their feelers and touching every single combination of letter and number patches, and once it gets behind the correct pin, it will find a complete circuit across, say, F and 9, fire the electromagnet, attract the pin that it's right behind towards it, and then the pin will pop up. This is why the buttons need to be held down for the entire selection process, because we need the source of voltage between letter and number button to stay there until the selection accumulator has made an entire sweep. But then, of course, when it's done with its sweep, we need the buttons to pop back out so another selection can be made, and that's why the inner contact patches will briefly pulse power to that relay to disable the latch solenoid and reset everything. So now, finally, we can listen to the selection accumulator making actual selections. I'm doing a sequence here so that the selections occur later and later in the sequence. So I'm selecting A1, C1, E1, G1, and J1. And you'll be able to hear how the click of the pin popping up happens progressively later in the sequence of making the selection. In this clip, by the way, the turntable, the record changer, is disabled, so the only noise we'll hear is the selection accumulator. All right, so we have now established how selections get made. We've talked about the selection accumulator, we've talked about the buttons, and we've talked about the pins that will pop up for each and every selection. But there's one last thing the selection accumulator does which we haven't talked about yet, and that is turn the dang jukebox on. So towards the end of its sequence, not at the very end, it happens a little bit before the end, one of those two patches gets bridged by the feelers, and that sends power to the reset magnet. This reset magnet is part of yet another weird mechanical contraption, and all that it's there to do is turn on the jukebox and turn it off when it's done playing a record. This contraption is sitting on the metal plate that the carousel is on, so it's actually like between the carousel and the selection accumulator, and this unassuming little leaf switch. This tiny little switch is the main power switch for the record changer mechanism. If these contacts are touching, the record changer is awake, and if they're not touching, well, it's off. So the reset magnet pulls on part of this contraption, which will reset it and cause the contacts to touch. I'll explain why we have this contraption later on, but this will just give you that context that the power switch is here, and the selection accumulator is firing the magnet, which ultimately closes that switch. And when that switch is closed, the record changer has gone from its first to second of three modes. There are only three things the record changer can do, and they are nothing, so stand by, scanning, and then playing. So that power switch kicked us out of standby and put us into scan mode. So now that we are in scan mode, we will finally piece together what the heck is the purpose of all those pins, and why is the selection accumulator even there? So remember that the selection accumulator lives directly below the carousel of records. The carousel of records is a big circular object, and right below we have the circular selection accumulator with all of those pins for each and every selection. Attached to the bottom of the carousel of records, we have yet another weird contraption. I don't remember exactly what this thing is called, but we are going to call it the scanning mechanism. 
the scanning mechanism is mechanically linked to the position of the carousel of records. So as the carousel rotates, the scanning mechanism will also rotate. And the scanning mechanism is composed of two micro switches that are connected to little copper feelers that are riding just above all those pins. There is a tiny amount of clearance, just two millimeters or so, between these little copper feeler arms and the pins we've been talking about. The little feeler arms are connected to these little readout micro switches. They're labeled readout 1 and readout 2, and they correspond to side A and side B of the record. So these little feeler arms are sweeping over all of the pins as the carousel rotates. And if there's a pin that's sticking up, well, the feeler is going to collide with it. The motion of the carousel turning and pushing the feeler into the pin will eventually cause this readout switch to close, and that will energize either the side 1 or side 2 relays. And that is why the pins have those notches taken out of them. Because we're dealing with a circle, we can't really describe things in terms of right and left, so we'll go with inboard and outboard. And every other pin has a notch taken off of the inboard side, then the outboard side. These feelers that reach down and hover over the pins, they hover from both sides. So we have a feeler on the outboard side, that's readout 2, and a feeler on the inboard side, that's readout 1. So effectively, the notches that are taken out of the outboard side will cause readout 2 to always miss those pins. Even if they're sticking up, readout 2 will just go right past the notch. But readout 1 will hit that pin because there is no notch on the inboard side. And of course, the opposite is true. If we have a pin sticking up that has a notch on the inboard side, well, readout 1 will slip right past it, but readout 2 will hit the pin. So again, the purpose of these notches in the pins and these two feelers is so that we can tell the two sides of each record apart. The inboard feeler represents side A and the outboard feeler represents side B. I also want to note that because we have two adjacent pins that represent the same record in the carousel, these feeler switches are adjustable. We need the carousel to be in the same position for either pin, so effectively one of the feelers is reading a little farther ahead than the other, and that can be adjusted and calibrated to make sure everything works correctly. The scanning mechanism, by the way, because it's attached to something that goes round and round in a circle, isn't connected to the rest of the jukebox through wires, but instead has five feelers, much like we've been talking about on the selection accumulator, reaching up and touching five slip rings on a sort of board there. So the electrical connection between the scanning mechanism and the rest of the machine is accomplished through a slip ring pickup, basically. Okay, and now here's where we get to bring up that whole electrical simplicity, mechanical complexity thing once more. When either the side 1 or side 2 relays gets energized from the readout switches, literally all we are doing is redirecting power from the motor that turns the carousel and instead sending it to a different motor called the main cam motor. That's it. All the master power switch that the selection accumulator closed really did was start sending power to the motor that turns the carousel. It also sends power to the carousel lock magnet, which is what's making that loud buzzing. The motor is actually pretty quiet. But fundamentally, that's all that switch does. It just gets the carousel spinning. When the readout switches hit a pin and they energize the side 1 or side 2 relay, the power source from the carousel motor gets redirected to the main cam motor. What is the main cam motor, you ask? Well, what a great question. So the main cam motor, which is part of the Wurlematic mechanism, is responsible for, oh my gosh, so many things. In this clip, I've actually got the jukebox turned off and I've disconnected the main cam motor and connected it to a simple plug. It's actually a 120 volt motor. When I turn it on, you're going to see that a lot of the automated functions you would assume a jukebox does are all being driven by this single motor.
What we are seeing here is the record transfer arm grab a record, pull it out of the carousel, plop it onto the turntable, let go of it, then the tone arm move on top of the record, drop into the lead-in groove, and then finally we see that all happen in reverse. The tone arm picks up, goes back to its home position, the record transfer arm grabs the record again, picks it up off the turntable, and puts it into the carousel. This is entirely mechanical. This whole process is happening because of one motor spinning. Think about all the things that need to be accomplished here. From the beginning, we need the little record grabby thing to actually grab onto the record, and then we need to pull the record transfer arm back away from the carousel, turn it sideways, and then put it onto the turntable. Then we need to again release the little grabby arm and actually move the turntable slightly so that the record is moved away from the arm. That way it can spin freely. Then we need the tone arm to move on top of the lead-in groove of the record, and the tone arm needs to drop down so it actually lands on the record. Oh, and also the record turntable needs to be turned on so it starts spinning. And then finally we need to be able to do all that again in reverse. And it's pretty wild when you consider that this is a purely mechanical device. It's just one electric motor turning a huge series of cams pretty slowly, and those cams are just making all this stuff work. And trust me, when I say a huge series of cams, I am not exaggerating. So the electric motor that actually drives this thing is hanging underneath the record changer, and it drives a gear reduction drive because this cam mechanism runs actually quite slowly. It runs at about 7 RPM. It takes roughly 9 seconds for an ent entire cycle to complete. Now, since I haven't really said it, in case you're not familiar, cams are basically not quite round objects that something is riding against, so as the shape of that object changes, the thing riding against it will move. The classic example are the tappets on the camshaft of an internal combustion engine which open the intake and exhaust valves. But in this case we're doing a ton of different stuff. So the main cam, the reason why this is called the main cam motor and the main cam relay, is not quite a gear. It's a big metal circle which has gear teeth on its edge, which I guess that is a gear, but uh, anyway. The main cam, the gear teeth are really just so the motor can drive it, and inset to this round circle there is a vaguely heart-shaped groove. Now sticking into that groove is basically like a, a running cam, it's just kind of it's running inside of a groove, so it's still, it's still a cam, but it's a little bit different than you might be used to. And so as the cam rotates, the thing sticking inside of it is going to be rocked back and forth because that groove is heart-shaped. As that rocks back and forth, it actually pulls down on another geared piece, and that is attached to the record transfer arm. So really this is that's the most complicated thing going on here because it's hard to describe, and um, it is also the most robust piece of this contraption. But of course moving the record transfer arm is just one of many tasks, so stacked to the right of the main cam we have a series of what I believe are nylon cams. There's at least five, and there might actually be some more that I can't see. And these ones, well, some of them push on levers, one of them actually pulls a cable, and uh, because this is all in one location, but there's a number of different things we have to do, that's why we have these rather odd linkages, cables, pulls, guides. There's just a whole bunch of stuff that is ultimately coming around to this contraption and riding against one of those cams so that as it rotates, different mechanical things are accomplished depending on the position of the cam. So it's all mechanically programmed in this big 
circular thing so that as it makes a rotation, different things are getting pulled, pushed, tugged, and even more as we will discuss shortly. But, and if it's not obvious, I inserted this later because I realized I didn't really explain the cams that much. Uh, keep in mind that this one motor is doing all those things we talked about. Just having a motor run pulls the record out of the carousel, puts it on the turntable, releases it, uh, moves the tone arm, and it actually does some stuff that I haven't even talked about in this video, but that is all happening because this single motor is spinning. But of course, the main cam motor doesn't just have power on continuously or the jukebox would be useless. So I told you that when the readout switches hit one of the pins, the side one or side two relay will redirect power from the carousel motor to this motor, the one we've just been looking at. Well, cool, but now what? See, in addition to all that mechanical stuff, we also need the whirl to stop in the middle of its sequence so that the record can actually play. And we also need to find a way to put the selection pin back. Because imagine if the feeler arm is still touching that pin, well now the jukebox is stuck in this state forever. So as part of the whirl mechanism, we have three control switches that are again, absolutely essential to all this stuff happening. So perhaps the most important switch here is the transfer switch. This is a little micro switch and it has the same exact function as those contact patches on the selection accumulator, which keep it in motion whenever it's not in its parked position. If we go back to the clip where I had the main cam motor running continuously, we'll see that the transfer switch is depressed by the actual surface of the cam it's running against nearly continuously, and it's just let go for just a moment when the record changer arm is back and it lets go of the record. So again, the transfer switch, whenever the record changer arm is out of its home position, is pressed in. But see, the transfer switch actually has three wires going to it. That means this is a make or break switch. So we have a common contact and one contact is normally open and the other contact is normally closed. So when the switch is pressed in, it's redirecting which wire is common to the middle wire, essentially. Now, again, I don't have the schematics in front of me to verify that what I'm about to tell you is 100% accurate from a circuit design perspective. But the reason the transfer switch has to both give power to the main cam motor whenever it's depressed and also take power away from something else is that we are about to cause a conflict that the transfer switch will prevent from becoming a problem. So remember, the main power switch for the record changer just sent power to the motor that turns the carousel. Then a feeler hit a pin, so a relay closed, which redirected that power to this main cam motor. Then as soon as it was out of its home position, the transfer switch was depressed, so that way the motor will continue to turn if for some reason we lose the signal from the readout switches. And here's the thing, we have to lose that signal because if we don't push the pin back down, the carousel will never move again. So the very next thing that's going to happen as the record transfer arm is pulling the record out of the carousel is that second control switch gets activated by a cam on the whirl mechanism. That switch is called the cancel switch. And this will send voltage to a pair of solenoids on the readout mechanism, which will push the pin back down. If you listen closely to this clip, you'll hear a dink dink happen shortly after the carousel stops. And that is that solenoid firing. So now here's why we have a conflict. We've put the pin back, which means neither readout switch is tripped. So the carousel wants to move. However, we cannot let the carousel move because the record transfer arm is not back in its home position. So the transfer switch, in addition to making sure that the whirl will get back to the home position now that we've lost the signal from the readout switches, will lock out the carousel to make sure that it does not move until it's back to that home position. I hope this makes sense. Again, 
I'm just talking about this verbally, and I hope that if you can't see what we're talking about, uh, this makes some sense to you. And even if you can see, I hope it makes sense because it's a little bit convoluted. But again, all that we had happen was the main power switch closed, so the motor turned on for the carousel to start looking for a record to play. Then the feeler hit the pin, so a relay energized, which redirected power from the carousel motor to this main cam motor. Then as soon as it started moving, we hit the transfer switch to make sure that it keeps moving because we are about to get rid of that signal by pushing the pin back down. And once we've done that, we now have a conflict because two things want to move, but we need to make sure that the carousel motor does not move. So earlier I said that the record changer had three modes. There's standby, scanning, and playing. Initially, we got into the scan mode because the main power switch closed, and then when one of the readout switches hit a pin, that effectively served as an interrupt to the scan mode and then put us into play mode. The transfer switch is now acting like an additional interrupt to make sure that we stay in the play mode until the record changer arm is put back. But we actually need one more interrupt because we want to play the record. Remember, if the main cam motor just keeps on going, it's going to put the record right back. So that is where our third control switch comes in. In the very middle of the sequence of pulling the record out of the carousel, putting it on the turntable, in the middle of the cam's rotation, there is a little lever that will press on the play switch. Now the play switch is also two switches in one. Uh, the first thing that it does is it actually mutes the auxiliary input to the amplifier. So you can actually have the jukebox hooked up to like a, a radio tuner and playing the radio, but then when you make a selection, it will mute that and actually play the record. But the other thing that this switch does is it serves as an interrupt to the main cam relay. So basically, when this switch gets pushed in, we have broken the circuit path through all these other switches to shut off the main cam motor. The play switch gets depressed right after the tone arm lands on the record. And once it's depressed, the jukebox enters a really weird Frankenstein zombie state. Everything wants to move, but it can't for various reasons. So remember, the main power switch is closed, which means that the carousel wants to be turning. However, the transfer switch is pressed in because the Wurlamatic mechanism is out of position, so the carousel motor is locked out. But the transfer switch is also trying to send power to the main cam relay to keep the Wurlamatic mechanism turning. But because the play switch is pressed in, that circuit is broken, so the main cam relay is not pulled in and the main cam motor does not turn. Everything wants to turn right now, but because of the physical position of the Wurlamatic mechanism and the fact that it's pressing on the play switch, it's stuck. To get us unstuck, all we need to do is bypass the play switch. And how do we do that? Why? With the tone arm switch. So when the tone arm reaches the lead out groove of the record, it's going to press on another micro switch, and that will actually jump the current path around the play switch, essentially. So once the record is over, we've bypassed the lockout on the play switch, which is going to start getting the Wurlamatic mechanism going. We actually have an interesting thing happening here where the tone arm switch is not exactly working right, and we hear this pulsing as it's trying to bump the main cam motor. With these pulses, the motor is turning just a little bit. We can actually see the cam move slightly, but until it moves enough to let go of the play switch, it's not quite on its way. However, eventually it gets there, the play switch is let go, and now the transfer switch is able to keep the Wurlamatic mechanism turning again. So, it picks the record up off the turntable, puts it back into the carousel, and then once it lets go of the record, the transfer switch gets released, and now the carousel will turn again.
Now that the carousel is turning, we can finally discuss the purpose of that weird contraption for the power switch. Because you can make a selection while a record is playing, there's the possibility that you could make a selection behind the one that is currently playing. Now, if the jukebox were designed to turn off when the record carousel gets back to its home position, then that record wouldn't play. It would turn itself off and that would be bad. People would not like that. So there is a latching mechanism that has to be struck two times before the jukebox turns off. You can hear a loud click here. That is the carousel hitting that mechanism. This occurs right when it's on the record position A1. The first time it hits this mechanism, the carousel just keeps rotating, and that ensures it's going to make another complete 360 degree search in case there is a selection that was made behind the one it was just playing. But when it gets back to the home position the second time, it will in fact shut off. So the reset magnet, the thing that the selection accumulator pulsed power to to turn the jukebox on, was resetting this little mechanism, and every time you make a selection, it fires that magnet. So regardless of how many times the carousel has turned around, if it's made it past once, it's going to reset that mechanism, and it will take two complete rotations to shut off. It's actually a very clever and smart design feature, and undoubtedly saved many complaints. So yeah, that's about it. This thing is wildly complex, but not really. There's only seven relays in the entire jukebox that make this whole thing work. It's just a clever arrangement of switches and cams to make sure that things happen in the right sequence and other things cannot happen when things are in the wrong position. Now, the last thing that I haven't talked about yet is how the record changer changes sides. We know that there's a different feeler for side one and side two, but what does that do? Well, as the record changer arm pivots back from the record carousel, it has a sort of weird gear train at its pivot. It looks something like an automotive differential, and there's a pin on each side of this gear train. That pin, when it gets stopped, is what causes the record changer arm to actually start turning as it falls down. That way the, it goes from a vertical position to a horizontal position. We can change which pin gets stopped. So there's a little mechanism that moves left and right to change which of those pins gets caught. And if the side one readout is the one that's activated, the side one relay, in addition to stopping the carousel motor and all that stuff, will send power to a solenoid that moves that bracket over. So essentially, if we have selected side one, then that relay energizes, which pulls in that solenoid, and that changes which direction the record changer arm will land, or which direction the record changer arm will pivot before it lands onto the turntable. And speaking of electromechanics and lockouts, another thing that happens with side one and side two, well, you could select both sides of the same record. So how's it gonna deal with that? Well, side one has priority over side two. So if both feelers are activated at the same time, essentially, so long as the side one relay is energized, the side two relay cannot energize. That is also, by the way, how it knows which cancel solenoid to send voltage to. It depends on which relay is pulled in. And I am not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure that there is a capacitor in line with the side one relay to make sure that it stays held in for longer than it has the voltage supplied to it. That's again part of the sequencing issue. We need the side one relay to stay pulled in until the cancel switch is no longer being uh, fed voltage. That way only the side one pin gets rejected and not side one and two. 
So again, I know I'm just running through this really fast, but if both the side one and side two feeler switches get activated at the same time, well, the side one relay will prevent the side two relay from pulling in, and that way it will play side one first, cancel that pin, and then when side one is over, we will have that weird scenario where it grabs the record, puts it back into the carousel, but because the side two readout is still depressed, it just pulls it right back out again and plays the other side. But that, I think, is it. I'm gonna run through this once more and then we'll wrap up. So we drop a quarter into the jukebox. That adds a certain number of credits to the credit unit. If the credit unit has credits on it, it will send voltage to the latch solenoid. The latch solenoid is pulling on the weird little trident linkage, and one of the things that does is close a switch, which allows us to make a selection, and it will hold down the letter and number buttons when we press them. When we press a letter button, we create a circuit path on the letter patch on the selection accumulator, and then when we press the number button, we complete that circuit path across all of the corresponding number patches on the selection accumulator. The instant both buttons are pushed in, the selection accumulator gets a burst of voltage, which kicks it out of its park position, and then it will keep going until it gets back to the home position. As it rotates around, the electromagnets are sweeping behind all those pins, and when it gets behind the pin for the selection we've made, it bridges that circuit created by the buttons, fires, attracts the pin towards itself, and the pin pops up. Then, right when the selection accumulator is back to its home position, it pulses a relay inside the jukebox, which will release the latch solenoid, so pop the buttons back out. And fire the reset magnet and turn on the record changer. At this point, we have a pin sticking up in the selection accumulator, and the carousel motor has power to it to start turning. The readout switches below the carousel will eventually run into the pin. So whatever pin we ran into, the switch gets activated, and that redirects power from the carousel motor, causing it to stop, and sends it to the main cam motor, which grabs onto the record and starts pulling it out of the carousel. As that is happening, the main cam hits a switch, the cancel switch, which sends voltage to a solenoid, which pushes the pin back down, and the transfer switch, because it is pressed in by the cam, will prevent that from causing the carousel to start turning again. So we keep going, we pull the record out of the carousel, and we plop it onto the turntable. Then the record gets released, the turntable moves over a bit, and the tone arm comes down over the record, and drops on the lead-in groove. Right after that happens, the main cam hits the play switch, which puts everything on pause. We now have everything wanting to move, but it can't. The record plays, la di da di da and at the end of the record, the tone arm goes into the lead-out groove, and once it gets to the center, it trips the tone arm switch, which bypasses the play switch, sending power again to the main cam relay to get the main cam turning. Once the main cam has released the play switch, it will keep going on its own, and it lifts up the turntable, or it lifts up the tone arm, puts it back, grabs the record, lifts it off the turntable, puts it into the carousel, and right when it lets go of the record, the transfer switch is released, so power is once again redirected from the main cam relay and back to the carousel motor. carousel is turning again, it hits its home position A1, and we hear that click, but it's still searching for records just in case you had made another selection, and then when it gets back to its home position, we hear that click again, the main power switch opens, and we are done. So I hope this video made sense and that you enjoyed it. This is probably the most difficult sights and sounds video I will ever make, especially since I had no intention on making this series when I uh, filmed all this b-roll, but I hope that it was valuable to you and I hope that it was at least somewhat entertaining. 
Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you again soon.